Sonorous Swifters, it's Prof G, and we're going to use your newfound skill in manipulating that tremendous toggle to turn sound in your app on or off. And while doing this, we'll explore an edge case that could crash your app, and we'll learn how to fix it using compound conditionals. So we'll learn about the double ampersand for and, and the double bar for or. Conditions are ripe for big learning. Let's code. So the last time we worked with the UR Awesome app, we created functions to generate a random value, which we then passed in as part of a sound name to play sounds. And this works great, but sometimes you might want to see your inspirational message and your inspirational image, but you might not want to have that sound play. Not everyone is prepared for your auditory awesomeness. So in order to curtail the dulcet tones of your app, we'll add a toggle so we can turn the sound on or off. And as you see it in this final app, we'll place the toggle to the left of the show message button. And as you can probably tell in here, we've got a spacer between these two elements. Now setting this up is a bit trickier than it looks, but we'll skill you up so you have no setbacks. If I want to place a toggle to the left of my button, I need an H stack before the button. So I'll add that before the button and put the close curly after the button. You could have also option command clicked on the button and then select from the menu embed an H stack. And then after the H stack, I'm going to add my toggle. So let's select the option with title and is on binding bool variable. Then we'll press return to add this to our code. And for the title, let's pass in the string as sound on colon. And for our is on value, we need to create a new state variable. So let's head up to the top of your code. And under the other state values, we'll write at state private var. Why don't we call this sound is on lower camel case. And we'll set this equal to true. Then we can head back down to our toggle and we'll add that binding bool. Remember, since it is a binding bool, we have to put the dollar sign in front of the sound is on variable. That's looking good. Our toggle shows up. Now let's add a spacer in between the toggle and the button. And hmm, this looks like the spacer isn't doing anything. Let's explore why. First, let's see what happens if we change the label to an empty string. Huh, we still see the toggle pushed next to the button. And it looks like there's text in there that's taking up all of the space, even though I have no string in that part of my toggle. Let's add a border around the toggle view to take a look at the space it's taking up on screen. Remember we tried this technique in an earlier lesson? So we'll use the dot border modifier below the toggle. I'm going to pass in dot blue as my border color. And ah, it looks like the control has the label out to the left, even if there's nothing in it. And it pushes the toggle control out to the right. Now we want the label to be right next to the toggle control. Well, one way we can fix this is actually to hide the label and then replace the text that we would normally put in the label by adding a text view in front of the toggle view. So try this. I'm going to introduce you to a new modifier called label is hidden. Under toggle view, let's type dot hidden to access some modifiers that work on hiding aspects of the view. And you'll see one in here that says label hidden. And this one says that it hides the labels of any controls contained in the view. It takes no parameters. So press return to add this. And sure enough, our toggle is pushed over to the left, kind of like what we want. We just need to add a text view to the left of the toggle and use that as our label. And so just above our toggle view code, I'm going to add text. And in between parens, pass in the string sound on colon. And look at that. We got what we want. Now we can delete the blue border on the toggle. Now what we want to do is to take a look at this sound is on value. And if it's false, we want to make sure that we don't play our sound. So all we need to do for this is to head down into our button action and down here where we make the call to play sound before we call that function, we want to wrap it in an if statement that says if sound is on open curly, remember sound is on is a Boolean value. So if it's true, we'll go in between the curlies, make sure that you put a closing curly after the play sound function will execute the play sound. But if sound is on is false, that toggle is clicked off. We'll never play the sound. So let's try this out. If I click the toggle off, then click the show message button. I don't hear any sounds. That's great. Yay! But if the sound is already playing, clicking the play sound toggle doesn't stop the sound from playing. It would be nice if we could detect if somebody had tapped the toggle and if the sound was playing, we could stop the sound from continuing to play. Let me show you how we do that. What we want to do is see if someone has tapped the toggle. And if they did, if the sound is playing, then we want to stop the sound from playing. So first, to perform an action when the toggle is pressed, we're going to add a new modifier to the toggle with 
dot on change. Now code completion describes this as adds a modifier to the view that fires an action when a specific value changes. It accepts two values and it doesn't give us info about the types we've used, but no fear. Press return to accept this. And for the of value, just add sound is on. So this says when that variable sound is on has changed, then I'll tab over to the perform parameter. Now this is a closure that's going to execute when sound is on changes. So I'm going to press return to get this in the trailing closure format that I like so much. And we don't need to compare the new value for what sound is on is going to become. So I'm just going to put an underscore character in here instead of new value. But what we do want to do between the curlies is to stop the audio player from playing if the audio player is playing. And the audio player object has a property and a method that we can use for this. First, inside the on change closure, write if audio player dot is playing. And notice what code completion says in its description, a Boolean value that indicates whether the player is currently playing audio. Nice, straightforward, we want this. Press return to accept this. Now in between the curlies, how do we stop the audio player from playing if this is true? Well, audio player has a method named stop. So we'll enter audio player dot stop, no parameters for this, but the code completion says stops the playback and undoes the setup the system requires for playback. Stopping the playback sounds like what we want. So press return and let's try this out. Show message will play a sound, but now using the toggle to set the sound off, we'll stop any sound from currently playing. Stop the sound playing, nice. Solid work, Swifter. More skills. But we've got one more issue to worry about, and this is what developers call an edge case. An edge case is a set of circumstances that might not normally occur when using your app, but if it does occur, it could cause problems. In our case, it would crash our app. Now, this is going to happen if you launch the app, but instead of pressing show message right away, you instead turn the sound off right away. Now, watch this. I'll restart the app in the preview, then I'll turn the sound off, and yow! Preview crashed! Now, on my current version of Xcode, Preview doesn't tell me much about the crash, but if you're in need of more info about a crash, just launch the app simulator. I'll click on the play button. Then when your app launches, repeat the same steps. I'm going to click to turn the sound off. And ah, look at the error that comes up. This red line in my code shows the exact spot where my code crashed. Now the red underline in this line of code is Xcode's best guess at what caused the problem. So it's underlining audio player because it seems that's the culprit. Now if we click the three lines next to the word thread, we see a more complete error description. Xcode says fatal error unexpectedly found nil when implicitly unwrapping an optional value. And it says the same thing in the console down here. What gives? Well, you might recall that we had to declare but not initialize our audio player. See up top here with our state variables? Because we didn't have access to the assets catalog file, which is what we need to set up the audio player. So to be clear, when the code first starts and it hits this line, the audio player box to hold the data is created. We call that declaring the variable, but it hasn't been initialized. There's nothing in that box or in the variable called audio player. Since it has nothing in it, we refer to that as being nil. That's as opposed to these other values here, which we initialize we set them equal to something. Now if we scroll down to our play sound function, I'll hide the navigator's pane so you can see things better. This line of code here with the try in it actually tries to assign data to the audio player. So if we get to this line and the try works, we don't have nil in audio player anymore. Instead, audio player has been set up and it has the data we need to play the sound. No problem. We haven't run into any problem down here before. But the successful setup of the audio player only happens when the show message button is pressed. If we don't first press show message to play a sound, and then instead we just click the toggle button first and turn sound off, this line here looks inside the audio player to try to find the is playing property. But since audio player is nil, there is no is playing property. And you can't look at a property in Swift if you're expecting a value, but instead get nil. If that happens, the code will crash. So how do we fix this? Well, we just want to make sure that the audio player does not equal nil before we go ahead and take a look for the is playing property. Now, before we solve this, let me also show you the variables pane. If yours isn't showing, just click the show variables pane icon in the lower right hand corner of Xcode, and you should see the pane show up on the left. Now, you'll see a little triangle in here that says self, and in parentheses, it says you are awesome content view. Now, if I click the triangle to expose what's in this heading, I see an underscore in front of all of the property names that I've created for the content view struct. 
And if you click the triangles next to each of these items, you see the values of each of these variables exposed underneath. You can ignore the location information, but we see the strings are all empty string. That's what we initialized them to when the app launched. We also see all the numbers are initialized to negative one and audio player, ah, it's nil. That's the reason why our app crashed. So if your app ever crashes, you can explore the variable pane to see what various values were at the point in which your app crashed. This can be really useful and we will definitely see this more in future lessons. Lessons. So I verified, yep, my audio player was nil when my app crashed. So now we can hide the variables view pane and hide the debug pane. And I'll click on the stop square in the toolbar. And now let's figure out how we can make sure that we don't try to look at any value inside of an audio player that's nil. Well, there are a few ways to do this. One, which you already know, is we can check to make sure that audio player is not equal to nil. So just before if audio player dot is playing, I can write if audio player exclamation point equals, that means not equal to, nil, lowercase n-i-l, open curly, put the closed curly after the interior ifs curly, and this is what's called a nested if statement. There's an interior if statement that's nested in or inside of an exterior if statement, and the interior if statement will never be reached unless the exterior statement is true. So in our case, it's only reached if it's true that the audio player does not equal nil. Remember, that's what caused our code to crash. So why don't we check this out? We'll click resume in preview and click play in the lower left hand corner and click toggle. No crash. Nice. Does the rest of the app work? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So I'd cheer for you too. But nested if statements are usually something we want to avoid if we can, and that's because they push the code over to the right, and that makes code harder to read. So let me show you another technique, the compound conditional. And to demonstrate the compound conditional, I'll enlist the help of the Grandmaster of Funk, his royal badness, the late great purple one, Prince. Now in this sample code, two ampersands, that's these squiggly guys here, on the US keyboard you'll find the ampersand above the seven key, these two characters next to each other, no space, act as a conditional and. That means for something to be true, then both what's on the left side and the right side both need to be true. So either side of the double ampersand is either a Boolean expression or a value that returns true or false. So this must be true, and this must be true for the whole statement to be true and for the first set of curlies to be executed. But if either side of the double ampersands is false or both of them is false, then we skip the first set of curlies. And if there's an else, we'll execute what's in the else clause. Since we're evaluating more than one Boolean condition on a single line, we refer to this as a compound conditional. So if the person's first name equals Prince, and double ampersand, the last name is the empty string, then we will be greeted with dig if you will my swift code. Otherwise, we'll print the greeting rock on coder. A silly example, but if we try this out in our playground, we'll see first name prince, last name empty string, dig if you will my swift code. But if the person we're greeting is prince, but last name Charles, we simply say rock on coder. Nice. But we can get even more complex because, if you didn't know, Prince is actually Prince's real first name, given at birth, but he does have a last name. It's Nelson. Here's his passport photo to prove it. This may be the world's baddest, in a good way, passport photo. I can only aspire to look so cool. So what we'd like to do is offer up the princely greeting if the person's first name is Prince and the last name is either Empty String or Nelson. And to do that, we'll use the conditional or operator. That's two bar characters, no space in between them. The bar characters are almost never typed, but on a US keyboard, you'll find the bar character as shift backslash key, which is just above the return key. And if either of these conditions is true, last name is empty string or last name is Nelson, then the whole area between the parens is true. Then this result will be compared using the and double ampersand operator. And if the left side and the right side are true, we will greet them print style. Let's show you this in a playground. So before last name double equals empty string, I'm gonna add an open parens. Then after the empty string, I'll type a space, then two bar characters. Again, that's shift backslash, which is above the return key on the US keyboard. Then space, then last name double equals in quotes Nelson and close parenthesis. So this entire expression only evaluates true if the first name is Prince and either the last name is an empty string or the last name is Nelson. Let's shift return with Prince Nelson, dig if you will my Swift code. But with Prince empty string, we also dig if you will the Swift code. And with Prince Charles as the last name, rock on coder. And if we have last name as the empty string, but the first name is Adele, we also greet her with rock on coder. Nice. 
And if it helps, you can always consult the truth table with double ampersand, the logical and. The expression is only true if both sides of the ampersand are true, but with the logical or, that's the double bar, an expression is true if either side of the double bar is true or if both sides are true. Now, I also recommend that you use parentheses to group the order of items you want evaluated in any compound conditional with three or more expressions. That'll help the reader know which part of an expression is to be evaluated first. So now that we know how to use compound conditionals, let's try this out in our code. So now in our nested if statement, I'm going to delete the curly brace above it and the second if, and with both Boolean expressions on the same line, I'm going to put a double ampersand in between them, and I'm going to remove the closing curly that was around the nested if that you just deleted. And to fix my indentation, I will command A to select all, control I to fix indents. This looks good. Now let's try it out. Turn that switch off. No crash. Exquisite. Yay! Sound works. Sound shuts off. Yay! Once again, we had big learning. All in the name of getting a sound on off toggle to work properly, we use the label hidden modifier to allow a toggle to be left aligned in an H stack. We learned about the on change modifier that executes code if a value has been changed. We learned about the AV audio player is playing property and its stop method. We introduced the concept of the edge case and prevented an edge case from crashing our code. We explored the variables view or variables pane in the debug pane. We used nested if statements and we learned about compound conditionals, the double ampersand logical and, and the double bar logical or. Skilled one, your app is nearly done. I hope you're feeling good about what we've accomplished. Just a little bit more to go in this app, but there are many more apps ahead. Let the hacking continue.